morning, our speaker for our Nirvana and Death Memorial Day service is Reverend Sol Kahn. He was born and grew up in the Philippines. He received a degree in nursing and served as a nurse in the United States for many years, specializing in dialysis. On a visit to Kyoto, Reverend Kalu encountered the Jodo Chinchu teachings, which led him to study Buddhism and receiving his Tokugo ordination in 2007 and full Kyoshi ordination in 2010. Reverend Kalu has served at the Hongpo Honganji Hilo Betsuing, Makawa Honganji Buddhist Temple on Maui, and is currently assigned to the Hongpa Honganji Hawaii Betsune. Reverend Kao speaks Japanese and enjoys writing kanji, or the Japanese writing using the Chinese characters. His interests include snorkeling, martial arts, science, and travel. Reverend Kao. Let's put our hands together in the show. <clears throat> Buddha is fully enlightened, the happy one, the knower of the world. His Dharma teachings are essentially timeless and inviting investigation, leading to emancipation to be comprehended by the wise, each for himself. The order of the disciple is to fare well, righteously, wisely, and dutifully, worthy of honor, of hospitality, of offerings, of veneration, that is the supreme field for meritorious deeds in the world. Virtues dear to the noble ones are liberating, praised by the wise, uninfluenced by worldly concerns, and favors concentration of mind. This, Ananda, is the teaching called the mirror of the Dharma. Through it, the worthy disciple may know how far he has come toward enlightenment. The words of Shakyamuni Buddha, Namo Amida Namo Amida Namo Amida Good morning everyone. Good morning. Aloha. Konnichiwa. <laughs> Welcome to this morning's service here at Windward Buddhist Temple. I would like to thank first of all Reverend Bert Sumikawa for inviting me to be the speaker here this morning and also the members of this temple. Ailua Honganji originally for your warm welcome this morning. This is my first time to come here actually in this temple, inside, yeah? It's beautiful and I'm really impressed. And I, this has come to be the youngest temple for the Hongpa Honganji Mission of Hawaii, yeah? So, congratulations. <laughs> Today, we are observing a special day in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. And although it is not considered a major service in our Honganji tradition, Nonetheless, it is a very important day, not only to us Buddhists here in Hawaii, <laughs> but to Buddhists all over the world as well. Today we are observing Nirvana Day, or in other Mahayana tradition, it's called Pari Nirvana Day, the day that the father of Buddhism, Shakyamuni Buddha, passed away into final enlightenment. Now the two terms, nirvana and parinirvana, in the strictest sense, are not interchangeable. They may sound alike, but there is a difference. And what is that difference? It can be clearly explained by Shakyamuni, Buddha's own life experience. The first one, called nirvana, came on Bodhi Day. That was when he, was, he meditated under the Bodhi tree after a period of severe fasting and other ascetic practices, which did not lead him any closer to enlightenment. After receiving nourishment from the maiden Shujata, Shakyamuni Buddha resolved to sit under the Bodhi tree and vowed not to rise until he attained enlightenment. His enlightenment, which he achieved on the third day, is a state called nirvana. Nirvana is the goal of Buddhist practice. This is why people became Buddhists in the first place. And it is the goal that the Buddha taught everybody to pursue since he began his teaching career soon after he had attained enlightenment. Nirvana, etymologically, 
means extinguished, like when a fire is extinguished. In Sanskrit, one would say that the fire is nirvana. This sense of being put out, then, is transferred to refer to the state where the suffering is put out. So it is a putting out of the suffering. There is no more suffering, thus one gains total liberation from samsara. Pari nirvana, on the other hand, literally means being put out all around. Now remember, nirvana is extinguishing of blind passion, now or not. But the physical body is still there. Pari nirvana means the same as nirvana, only that there is the emphasis on being totally extinguished. Meaning, it refers to the dissolution of the body as well, of one who has already entered nirvana. So, when one has entered nirvana, while one is alive, his ego attachment is completely dead, and when one finally dies, it is said that he enters pari nirvana, meaning his body too is gone. So that's the difference. Today we are observing Shakyamuni Buddha's pari nirvana. The day his physical body ceased to exist, no longer subject to aging, disease, pain, discomfort, and other forms of afflictions of the mortal body. The stories surrounding the Buddha's physical death are varied as to the actual cause of the Buddha's passing away. You all probably have heard at one time during the course we are studying the Dharma of the Buddha's last meal, which was offered by Kunda, a follower of his teachings, but not a disciple himself. The food offered by Kunda to the Buddha on his last meal was called Sukara Madaba in Sanskrit, translated into soft pork. It was actually a type of mushroom delicacy eaten even to this day, and it is known as truffles. <laughs> I <I've> never heard that. <laughs> Why did they call it soft pork? Because you know, in the old days, they used a pig to hunt for the truffles. Yeah, it grows underground, yeah? So when the pig digs, you know, before the pig eats it, they dig, dig, dig. <laughs> Actually, that's a reality. So it being a mushroom meal that the Buddha ate, it was speculated by some that the Buddha died of mushroom poisoning, <laughs> or if not, just plain food poisoning. His acute illness came after eating, and the symptoms were severe. Abdominal pain, bloody diarrhea, intense thirst, feeling cold and weakness. Based on these symptoms, some Buddhist scholars who are familiar with medical science speculate that the Buddha may have died of mesenteric infarction, a condition where the blood flow to the intestines is blocked leading to gangrene or death of tissues. One cause of mesenteric <coughs> infarction is blood clots due to old age. And the Buddha at that time was already 80 years old in frail condition. The main source of the Buddha's final days leading to his Parinirvana is the Maha Parinibbana Sutra. In this sutra, it is also stated that the Buddha had a similar illness a few months prior to his last meal and passing away, but he survived that illness after feeling the same symptoms as the last fatal one. Which version of why the Buddha suddenly became ill and later died is unclear, but the mushroom poisoning theory can be ruled out since troubles are not poisonous. Yeah. Food poisoning from improperly prepared food is unlikely since given that the host Kunda knew his guest <coughs> was the Buddha and wouldn't offer him anything but the freshest meal. Perhaps the mesenteric infarction theory is the most plausible 
It is described in the Mahaparinirvana uh, that the Buddha felt sharp stomach pains and bloody stools, intense thirst, feeling cold and very weak, which could have been due to blood loss, hypovolemic shock in medical terminology. <coughs> An interesting point is raised here. The Buddha attained enlightenment, the nirvana states, at an earliest age in his life, under the Bodhi tree. Nirvana, by definition, is that state of mind that one is free from all passions, desires, and wants, meaning all blind passions are born law in our Jodhisattva Jew Buddhist tradition. And all of them is extinguished. Yeah? Suffering ceases with the extinction of these blind passions. Yet, we can't help but wonder if the Buddha, a fully enlightened person at that time still suffered at the time he was experiencing the severe pain and discomfort of his last and fatal illness. Did he really feel physical pain? The Buddha probably experienced pain in his abdomen just as any of us would. What he didn't experience was suffering Without being attached to his thoughts, especially the thought of a separate self, it was simply something happening and physical pain is part of the body's way of telling us something needs attention. So in other words, the Buddha felt pain, but there was, there was no uh, emotional or uh, psychological attachment to it. He just felt it and he said, I'm not concerned about that. How is that different when we feel pain ourselves? We begin to worry, don't we? Say, so, oh, I may have something like a serious disease and so on. And so, that becomes suffering for us. You know? I think we think too much is the problem. Yeah? <clears throat> After enlightenment, the body still has physical pain. Okay? When this is required. We don't, what we don't have is suffering. Suffering is extra. Suffering comes from the thoughts that we have about physical pain. Physical pain simply happens when it does. Thinking that this is bad or should not be happening or worrying about what will happen next are the extra thoughts that are part of suffering. To awaken consciousness pain, or to the awakened consciousness, pain is just something that is happening along with everything else that is happening. There is no personal concern or identification about it. So then, we can conclude that the Buddha did indeed feel the severe pain of his sudden illness after eating his last meal. But being an already enlightened being, he just felt the pain without any suffering like any of us unenlightened beings would if we were to experience the same thing. This was the state of the Buddha's mind throughout the 45 years that he lived after attaining enlightenment. The Buddha was no doubt a supramundane being upon his enlightenment, but he was still a very human being with a body capable of feeling pain and discomfort. But because of his enlightened, enlightened state, all these pains, discomfort and bodily needs no longer caused the Buddha any kind of suffering. <clears throat> Shakyamuni Buddha lived for another 15 to 18 hours after the sudden illness precipitated by his last meal. He was all, most likely carried on a stretcher by his disciples to the town of Kusinagara, about 15 to 20 kilometers away, where he was nursed and warm, but eventually succumbed to shock from the blood loss. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> since the Buddha was suffering at that time, why did he bother to go 15 to 20 miles away? Actually, the, Parinibana, the Maha Parinibana Sutra says that the Buddha was not anticipating this to happen. It just happened all of a sudden. He was thinking of, you know, going to his place of birth. That's where he intended to die. But since this is all of a sudden, and he was very thirsty, 
he was given water, I think his fluid volume uh, kind of stabilized, he felt that, uh, okay, I'll be able to go on and continue to the next town, maybe I can find a doctor who can treat me. But unfortunately, he did not make it. He passed away after 20 hours later. His final resting place was between two solid trees with his head facing north. Before the Buddha passed away into Parinirvana or final enlightenment, he went into several meditative states, so he still meditated until his bodily function ceased to exist. His last words, according to the Maya, Mahaparindibana Sutra, are as follows. You should know that all formations are entirely impermanent. Even though I now have this body, I too am not exempt from being changed by impermanence. Being amidst birth and death is highly fearful. You should diligently make an effort, try to be free quickly from this fiery pit of birth and death. This is my last teaching. The time for my nirvana has come. Thus, Shakyamuni Buddha left his physical body and entered final enlightenment. The legacy he left behind was the teachings which became the essence of the Buddhist religion, now practiced by millions of people in Asia and other parts of the world. Although Buddhism evolved into many schools and became sectarian, Many years after Shakyamuni Buddha's death, the basic teachings of the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path remain as the core teachings on how to understand the causes and the way out of suffering in this samsaric existence. These basic teachings have not changed and still are relevant in this modern age. To spread these teachings, to help all suffering sentient beings was the main goal that drove the Buddha to spend 45 years of his life teaching and living a simple but highly respected and happy life. Why is Nirvana Day so important to Buddhists? Buddhists use Nirvana Day as an occasion for reflecting on one's future death and their relations to friends and those who have passed away recently. Buddhist teachings remain, remind them that everything is temporary and nothing remains the same. They are encouraged that matters of death should be accepted as something normal and it should not cause grief. So, <coughs> To Shinran Shonin, the founder of Ajahn Shinshu, Buddhist tradition, Shakyamuni Buddha's coming into this world was to serve only one purpose, and that is to teach the ocean-like primal vow of Amida Buddha. Shakyamuni Buddha did expound Amida's pure land in the Sutra of Immeasurable Light, the Contemplation Sutra, and the Sutra on Amida Buddha. In doing so, Shakyamuni Buddha opened to other sentient beings Amida Buddha's boundless compassion and wisdom, which offers salvation to those who are incapable of spiritual awakening through their own power. Shakyamuni Buddha thought about Amida Buddha's vow as a safety net for those whose karmic obstructions are too deep to overcome by one's self power. Today, we observe Nirvana Day, or Pari Nirvana Day, the Buddha's passing into final enlightenment some 2,600 years ago. <coughs> With reflection and feeling of gratitude to the man who threw away a life of luxury as a prince in his father's kingdom and chose to become a religious founder amidst the difficulties of the life of a wandering teacher. The Shakyamuni Buddha not only taught the ancient way he rediscovered the Bhattani enlightenment, but also left behind 
a vast collection of wisdom and that enables us to negotiate through the difficulties and uncertainties of this ordinary, unenlightened world we're now in. Let us now conclude by putting our hands together in Dashu again and saying in unison the three treasures of Buddhism. I go to the Buddha for guidance. I go to the Dharma for guidance. I go to the Sangha for guidance. Amo Amo Buddha. Thank you.